crews of Air America have been called the secret soldiers of the Cold War. For more than a decade, they conducted covert operations for the CIA under the guise of a commercial airline. Most of the men were lured to the unusual company simply by money and the promise for adventure. But they wound up flying under extremely hazardous conditions in one of the largest paramilitary operations in US history. Throughout the 1960s and early 70s, hundreds of airmen left their jobs with major airlines, private companies, and the military to work for Air America, a relatively obscure airline that operated throughout Southeast Asia. Many of the men were attracted to the company by rumors of high adventure and good pay. But few knew exactly what they would be doing, or even who they would really be working for. The structure of Air America was not revealed to the employees. The ownership, uh, who you worked for, and so forth was not revealed at all. It was basically said you were going to go work on some government contracts flying for a small airline in Southeast Asia. Many of the airmen were employed in rather traditional jobs that can be found within most commercial carriers. But it rapidly became apparent to some of the men that they were flying for much more than just your run-of-the-mill airline. These men flew an odd assortment of aircraft, providing humanitarian assistance for clients such as the U.S. Agency for International Development. But they also flew in support of a very different set of customers, a group of men who routinely greeted them in the field and provided them with very specific instructions that often went far beyond humanitarian support. It didn't take very long, I think, for any new air crew member to realize that, that quote, the customer or the prime customer uh, was the agency. And they were working on a daily basis, in most cases, uh, with case officers. The air crews form the heart of a covert Central Intelligence Agency mission in the Kingdom of Laos. Technically, U.S. military personnel weren't supposed to be stationed in Laos under terms of an international agreement. But working under the guise of a civil airline, Air America crews provided a wide range of clandestine support to the agency in what became one of the largest paramilitary operations in U.S. history. The project in Laos, the paramilitary project, the so-called secret war, would not have been possible without Air America. They were absolutely essential probably the, the single most essential element uh, of it next to, the, next to the troops on the ground. They were key. I mean, we, we had no way of moving overland. The terrain was terrible. I mean, it was just steep hills. I mean, it was really very difficult to move through. So we counted on Air America to provide all of our transportation and all of our supplies and move all of our troops. While the crews eventually learned who they were ultimately working for, the discovery was often of little consequence. Most of the men were lured to the program by the promise for adventure, exciting flying, and money. Crews were paid by the number of flight hours they accumulated, and were paid very well. The fact that the CIA was heavily involved in their day-to-day -day operations, and that many of those operations had military undertones, often mattered little to the men. I never thought too much about it one way or the other. It was just, uh, where do you want me today? And uh, can I get as many hours as you'll let me? And they'd say, yeah, go out and move, all, move it all. Move everything you, you can. We didn't care. I mean, I didn't really care who they were. If they're the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, or the CIA. It didn't, it didn't really enter into anything I did. I was working for Air America, and nobody ever told me that, that the CIA had anything to do with anything. I was never told that. I never asked. It wouldn't have changed my pay. It wouldn't have changed how I did anything. So why should I care? 
the Kingdom of Laos was officially neutral and at peace during the 1960s. In reality, though, it was a nation virtually under siege by North Vietnamese troops and by an indigenous group of communist forces known as the Pathet Lao. Laos occupied a critical position in Indochina. Military advisors in the U.S. maintained that it was the key state in the domino theory. If it fell to communists, the theory held that the remaining non-communist states would not be far behind. The U.S. took several steps to halt North Vietnamese aggression in Laos. To combat invading communist forces from the air, a daring group of covert forward air controllers known as Ravens scoured the countryside for signs of enemy activity and marked targets to be struck by American bombers. At the same time, U.S. planes pounded the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a vast network of roads and footpaths that ran through eastern Laos in an attempt to stop the flow of North Vietnamese men and supplies pouring into South Vietnam. To combat communist forces on the ground, the CIA trained and armed thousands of men from a rugged hill tribe known as the Mong. The force was commanded by General Vang Pao, a skilled combat veteran who received considerable financial and military assistance from the U.S. Air America's primary role was to provide airborne support to these and other anti-communist forces throughout Laos. The flying was intense. Pilots often flew 30 or more missions in a single day, shuttling men, food and supplies through extremely hazardous weather, across rugged remote terrain, into some of the most demanding landing sites in history. Over time, the men developed reputations for taking on enormous risk. The airline's motto said it all, anything, anywhere, anytime, professionally. The flight and ground crews were totally professional people. But over a period of time, we developed a, a kind of peer pressure and that you knew that uh, if you thought the weather was a little too bad and you couldn't get in, somebody else would. And of course, it's mighty hard to belly up to the bar that night with your friends that did the job and you didn't. So as a result, the extremely difficult became almost routine. And uh, what you'd say almost impossible was done on a, on a fairly regular basis. Adding to the risk the pilots faced each day was the ever-present danger of flying relatively slow, unarmed short takeoff and landing aircraft like the Helio Super Courier in a combat zone. There were no battlefronts or known secure areas in Laos. Ground fire could come from anywhere at any time. To make matters worse, forces loyal to the U.S. were known to randomly fire on passing aircraft sometimes with a lethal effect, for lack of anything better to do. CIA case officers worked closely with Air America to pinpoint known threats, but in the end, it was less obvious hazards in such a fluid combat environment. We spent an, uh, an enormous amount of effort uh, trying to make sure we knew uh, to the extent humanly where their gun positions were. Everything you possibly could know, this was a 24-hour-a-day uh, effort. Normally, Air America flew away from the guns. We didn't want to go get shot at. This was not a game of, of hey, you can't hit me, you know. We knew damn well they could hit you. They were the world's best gunners. They had the free sky to shoot at. Everything up there was unfriendly, so they could shoot anything they wanted to at you. They had a lot of practice. So you didn't go and tempt them. If you did, you were, you were nuts. The risk of being shot down confronted Air America crews at virtually every turn. Ultimately, more than 240 men were killed or went missing in action while working for the company. Many disappeared without a trace while flying seemingly risk-free missions known as milk runs. Losses had a profound impact on the entire Air America community. Many crewmen had their families with them and established close ties with one another over the years. John McRaney lost one of his best friends, George Ritter, 
on December 27, 1971, during a routine mission to transport ammunition to forces in the field. Both men took off from Udorn, Thailand, at the same time for different sites and were anxious to finish their work for the day. The next morning, their families were planning on heading back to the States together for an extended vacation. George uh, and I were going to have lunch together. We figured we'd probably both be back to Udorn about the same time for our next load. When I got back, I walked in the ops and checked the board, and uh, I didn't see uh, 293 was the number of the aircraft. I didn't see it off of Lunar Site 69 Alder. In fact, I didn't see it on. And I asked, you know, is, is 293 off of 69? And they started making communications checks, and uh, they found out that it never landed there. And, uh, we, of course, a search and rescue started that a number of people were involved in. And the bottom line is we never found a trace of the airplane. Despite the extreme danger, Air America crews became renowned for performing some of the most daring missions in all of Southeast Asia. Many pilots risked everything to recover downed airmen or to evacuate wounded troops from positions that were on the verge of being overrun. In the end, what started out merely as an opportunity for high adventure and good pay turned into something much more for these secret soldiers of the Cold War. You don't take a helicopter, fly a helicopter into what you know is going to be a hot landing zone where you're going to get shot at for money. You just don't do it. There's something else there. And I think it was that they wanted this to succeed. And they participated willingly in, in seeing to it that it did succeed. The men who flew for Air America were part of a legacy that started in the early 1950s, when the CIA secretly purchased Civil Air Transport, a small American-run airline that had set up service in post-war China. CAT continued to expand its commercial enterprise throughout Asia under its new ownership. But it was increasingly used by the CIA to conduct clandestine operations throughout the Far East and beyond. U.S. law precludes uh, what happens elsewhere, just taking military aircraft, taking the markings off, and putting the crews in civilian clothes. You have to have another mechanism. And that mechanism has been the air proprietary. And uh, the CAT Air America complex is the classic and the largest example of the, the CIA air proprietary. And it, by any standard, was an enormous success. It provided the US government uh, with a covert uh, clandestine air capability over a period of many years, used in many parts of the world, uh, and in major programs at literally no cost. By the early 1960s, a division of CAT's parent corporation had changed its name to Air America and had established two main facilities to support operations in Laos. Heavy transports primarily operated from a fixed wing facility located in Vencheng, the country's administrative capital. Most of the company's helicopters and a handful of other planes staged from Udorn Royal Thai Air Force Base, a vast complex located roughly 40 miles south of the Laotian border. Each day, hundreds of men fanned out from these facilities to transport massive loads of refugees, troops, food, medicine, weapons, ammunition, and other supplies throughout the Laotian countryside. Flight conditions in Laos were extremely hostile and demanding. During the monsoon season, which lasted for roughly five months out of the year, the weather changed rapidly with extended periods of heavy rain and thunderstorms. During the dry season, smoke from slash and burn agriculture created a dense blanket of haze that eventually stretched beyond all operational altitudes. 
Jim Ryan took his first flight in country during the monsoon season of 1962 and was shocked to discover exactly how pilots handled such rough conditions. We took off and we flew in the clouds for so many minutes in this direction and so many minutes in another direction and so many minutes in another direction. And after about 30 minutes, he pulls the power back and we start a, a turn in the clouds coming down. And we broke out in, in a valley that was not very large. And he lands in a mud hole and slides to a stop. <laughs> and uh, he said, this is Samtal. But the initial feeling was that I'll never learn to, to fly like this. These guys uh, have got something going I don't understand because they really, there's an instinct there that, that had to, obviously they had that I didn't have. We knew the area so well, we could look straight down, see the bend in the river or our ridge line, and pretty well know, not pretty well, know exactly where we were. So we could set up approaches into these airports based on, we knew where the airport was, even though we couldn't see it. And we knew what was directly under us, and so we would set up the approach, and we'd fly an approach into the airport and not see the airport until we were on a real short plan. Dozens of landing strips, or Lima sites, were carved into mountainsides throughout central and northern Laos in exchange for the support of key allies like the Hmong. Most of the sites were constructed by local villagers with assistance from USAID. The strips themselves were extremely crude by any standard and posed numerous challenges and hazards to pilots but they allowed crews to rapidly deliver badly needed supplies to extremely remote areas in a variety of rugged short takeoff and landing aircraft, like the Pilatus Turbo Porter. The Laotian sites were, were really, really just dug out of the side or the top of a mountain. And they were tough to, to land on. The, the strips were not flat, they were hilly. Even though they may be very short, they may have a turn in them. And the strip was also usually of a design that not on purpose, but you had to land in one direction and you had to take off in the other direction. So the choices were not yours as far as the wind. You may land with a tailwind and take off with a headwind or vice versa. And you're not talking about doing this once or twice a day. This was like 20, 25 times, sometimes 30 times in a day. The porter had a reversible pitch prop that allowed pilots to come to a stop before they reached the edge of a cliff. But safely landing on these mountain top perches was, in many ways, less than half the battle. Deep ruts and heavy erosion often cut across the narrow strips. Most sites were buffeted by high winds and were surrounded by erratic thermals. Many pilots perished on takeoff after misjudging the ever-changing external conditions or the weight and balance of the people and cargo they carried on board. Other than people, you lifted what you were putting in the airplane so you could sort of gauge the weight of what you were gonna haul out of this place. Because these strips were five and 6,000 feet above sea level and you were not gonna get a lot of power and you were going downhill normally on takeoff. So you judge the downhill slope, the wind, and you ran it up to full power and let it roll, and once you started rolling, the chances are you weren't gonna stop. If, if something happened, you were gonna go somewhere, one way or the other. Despite the incredible ability of Air America pilots to operate under such rugged conditions, in many areas, it was impossible to create even the most basic of airstrips. The airline employed a highly skilled group of helicopter pilots to support these areas, with aircraft like the Sikorsky UH-34, which was being phased out of use by the US Marine Corps, and later on with the newer Bell UH-1 Huey. These pilots, like their fixed wing counterparts, were confronted with a new set of dangers at virtually every site. Most of the landing pads were created in areas that were easy for troops to clear, but extremely challenging for pilots to safely reach. Sometimes, you, it basically, it was a controlled crash. He would just barely get on because the winds were bad. It was, the winds were bad, the pads were small, and they were high. And there would be dirt blowing up, and the, 
You'd have to do a flyover to make sure there was no parachutes or, or cardboard. Anytime you dropped anything, they'd scavenge it. And then they'd have all parachutes around the pad. If they didn't have them secured, they could blow up into the rotor blades. And we've had that happen more than once. So if you really look at the overall flying, it was without a doubt the toughest there was. Hard on machines, hard on people. You had to really be careful uh, approaching uh, these places for landing. Uh, but, you know, after a while, you got quite good at it. You can imagine. I mean, if you fly uh, as much as we were flying daily, you got really proficient. I mean, I'm sure that uh, our pilots were as good as any in the world uh, if you lived through it. You either got very good or you uh, left or you died. The danger of operating conditions in Laos was often intensified by the customer relationship maintained between Air America and CIA personnel. Pilots were routinely greeted in the field by agency case officers who had been assigned to organize and direct combat operations for the Hmong. Many of the officers became extremely adept at judging the capabilities and limitations of the various aircraft and pilots under their control. But at times, tensions could run high. The case officers would sometimes push you, and they would push you maybe beyond the uh, envelope of the aircraft capability. So you had to make the final uh, judgment. And uh, the basic rule is you always want to leave yourself a way out. You don't want to get yourself in so deep that, that you, if something goes wrong, you don't uh, have a fallback position. So you don't insult them. You just say, well, let's, let's think of another way. <laughs> or maybe we can make this in two trips. The, the relationships in general were good. It was a situation where there was a lot of pressure on everybody. I received complaints from the chief pilots uh, about some case officers who pilots thought were not careful enough. I received complaints from uh, case officers that there were some pilots that were not doing their job or were reluctant to do their job. But I think basically there was a strong mutual respect and that, that, that uh, everybody was trying to do a job. Uh, the pilots were, were, were strongly motivated to get the job done as, as we were. And in most cases, uh, you know, working accommodation uh, developed that uh, enabled that job uh, to be done. The stress of Air America flight operations was tremendous. Crews generally worked in shifts that lasted for at least four days and often lived in the remote areas that they served while on duty. Early on, many crews simply slept in or beneath their aircraft. As the war progressed, small barracks and hostels were built near larger sites. But in many cases, the crews became guests of the Hmong, who welcomed them to their villages with great hospitality. We lived in the villages sometimes eight, nine, ten days, and the people would give us a hut. Uh, we usually had a blanket or something to, to sleep in. Uh, we would eat their food, and breakfast in the morning would be rice and pork chops or maybe an egg. Uh, usually they'd give you a raw egg at night. Uh, in a glass, and uh, they always had Ovaltine. They always had hot Ovaltine. And the good thing about that was you knew it had been boiled, the water had been boiled, because they'd give it to you in a glass, and it was so hot you couldn't hold the glass. They were being pushed off for their homeland, and they were, uh, they didn't like that. They were ferocious fighters. And uh, the fact that we were helping uh, them to stay in their villages, uh, they really, appreciate that. I don't think anybody ever helped them in their life. Flight crews pushed themselves extremely hard while on duty. Air America paid its pilots a base salary of roughly $1,200 a month. But they also received additional money for every hour of flight time in Laos, for every hour of overtime, and for any special high-risk missions that they might be willing to volunteer for. As a result, many working up country could earn as much as $5,000 a month or more, much of which was tax-free, depending on just how adventuresome they wanted to be. For the most part, if they had an automatic gas pumper, you sat in the helicopter and gassed up. As soon as he pulled that thing out and corked the, the cap, crank her up, 
the clock's running. And the more you flew, the more you made. So the incentive was there. And also, the more you flew, uh, the quicker your month got over because they wouldn't fly you more than 100 hours. So you could fly, uh, gosh, two weeks. You were finished. You had the rest of the month off. Air America generally granted its employees in Laos at least a week off for every month that they flew to help them cope with the rigors of their jobs. The men also received free or reduced airline and hotel rates because of their association with what appeared to be a commercial carrier. The combination of perks and pay allowed many of the men to achieve a standard of living that went far beyond anything they had experienced before especially if they were single or had been serving in the military prior to joining the company. We traveled all over the world. I mean, uh, I've been all over the world several times. I've been every continent but one. But what happened then was you had money, you had time, and you got to see the world. Now, <laughs> when you have time and you have money, uh, the idle mind starts wandering. So we spent a lot of time in, in Bangkok at some of the local watering holes. And, and we would drink probably pretty heavy, I mean, not probably, real heavy sometimes. And we had, we had good times. And when you look back, it was the best of all worlds. You were doing pretty adventurous work, but you had plenty of time off normally. You traveled, you always had money, and, and you just had a good time. Most of the crews set up more permanent residence in either Udorn, Thailand, or in Venchen, the administrative capital of Laos. There, they were essentially expected to live on their own, surviving on the local economy as any other foreign businessman would. Many of the men had families, or started one while working in the region. Their children attended classes in Udorn at a school that was established and run by Air America or at a U.S. State Department school in Venchen. Overall, the day-to-day -day lifestyle of most crewmen was quite good, especially when compared to the lifestyle of most U.S. military personnel stationed in Southeast Asia. Many built or purchased well-appointed American-style homes where they lived a very normal existence with family and friends while off-duty. They really didn't provide anything for you. I mean, you were on your own. You had to find your own housing and uh, arrange your own uh, food, which was eating in uh, uh, native restaurants, because they were trying to uh, give people the idea that there was as little government contact, and we really and truly were an all civilian operation, which we were. We were uh, performing a paramilitary operation, and uh, it was a good life. I, I've, uh, it's the best lifestyle I've ever had. I, I live far better over there than, than I've ever lived here or ever will. You led a normal life. And if you were a drinker, you may drink too much, especially if you went up country and then, then the area got bad and you were in a, a bit of a problem. You'd say, what the hell am I doing here? I shouldn't be doing this. But you go home that night, eat a nice meal, maybe go out and see a movie over at the Air Force Base, come back, and you'd be on the schedule tomorrow, and go back up and do the same thing. The variety of aircraft flown by Air America's pilots varied almost as wildly as the loads they hauled and the methods used to deliver them. The company maintained a fleet of seemingly indestructible cargo planes like the World War II vintage Curtis C-46 Commando and newer, more capable aircraft like the Fairchild C-123 Provider. These large workhorses were used to haul massive ground loads or to airdrop pallets that included everything from 55-gallon drums of fuel to crates packed with weapons and ammunition, which crews jokingly referred to as hard rice. The delivery of airdropped parachute loads required considerable skill on the part of the pilot, who had to consider such factors as wind drift. But the most unusual and demanding method of air delivery was a process developed to quickly and inexpensively ship hundreds of tons of rice to villages and outposts
someone came up with the idea that uh, if you took a sack of rice and sewed it in another sack, a little bigger, and it was dropped where it had reached its terminal velocity, it had no more forward motion, it was falling flat, that it would hit the ground and the inside sack would break and the outside sack would contain the rice. And in fact, that's exactly the way it worked. It worked very well. It offered some challenges to the flight crew because uh, you had to be at the right altitude, at the right airspeed, and you had to be very, very accurate. You had to position yourself right over the drop zone. If you were too low, it still had forward motion, and, and it would hit the ground tumbling, and then, of course, you had rice all over the place. And uh, you would have the same problem if you were too fast, even if you were on the right altitude. If you were going too fast, it'd still have forward motion. So free-falling rice was kind of like bowling. Uh, when you rolled a strike, the minute it left your hand, you knew you had it. And if you missed, you knew that, too. <laughs> Crewmen known as kickers played a critical role in the success of large transport missions. They were responsible for loading and offloading all land-loaded cargo, for ensuring that the planes were properly balanced and operating within their weight limitations, and during airdrop missions, for safely muscling massive loads through the aircraft's open doors at precisely the right moment. They had a very dangerous job in that a lot of times up in the mountains it gets real rough on those airplanes and they're standing in the open doors. They've got heavy outsized cargo going out the doors. It's easy to get snagged by the cargo or uh, have some negative G's in the airplane due to turbulence and find yourself floating out the door. And uh, if you happen to be uh, in a position where the bad guys were shooting at you, uh, they'd shoot at the front of the airplane but they'd generally hit back in the back so the kickers were in a more hazardous position for getting ground fire than, than the pilots were. Air America's helicopter pilots generally flew alone, but were accompanied by a crew chief who played an even greater role during day-to-day -day operations. Among other things, they had to effectively gauge the capabilities of each aircraft and pilot in an ever-changing environment and make tough decisions about loading the aircraft accordingly. The versatility of helicopters also translated into an even wider array of cargo. Each day, the men handled dozens of different loads that included everything from live chickens and pigs to the bodies of those who had been killed during the day's action. They used to bring cattle right up beside the helicopter and actually slaughter them right beside the helicopter. They would shoot them, and they, as the cow would fall down, they would actually hack it up with, with machetes and throw, throw the meat into the helicopters. It would still be bleeding when they would throw it in the helicopters. And within five minutes, the whole cow would be inside the helicopter in bags. They would put them in burlap bags, and they would mark where each bag was supposed to go to, which pad you were supposed to put them to. While Air America's pilots and crews generally did not participate directly in combat, they served as the backbone for virtually all ground-based military efforts to defend Laos against invading North Vietnamese forces. During major assaults, the men played a critical role in attempts to hold a strategic corridor known as the Plain of Jars, ferrying thousands of men and tons of supplies throughout the region each day. The first few days of a uh, new campaign were uh, quite active and exciting because uh, you'd be moving troops uh, all day long sometimes from the main headquarters up to where the uh, new line was. So you'd be in and out all day long taking troops and uh, once they got situated then you'd be uh, taking uh, supplies, uh, food, uh, ammunition and stuff like that. And then. If they were successful and they moved forward, then you would move a little further, you know, kind of a hop uh, another, maybe another couple hundred yards or another uh, half a mile. Extensive involvement in combat operations often drove pilots to take extraordinary risks. Many helicopter crews took multiple hits to their aircraft while evacuating the dead and wounded from positions that were still under heavy fire but it was the carnage often witnessed during these evacuations that ultimately had the greatest impact on most crewmen. Gary Gens took part in some of the worst medical evacuations of the war when a Thai position came under attack on a ridgeline right above a top secret base known as Long Chen. 
we would pop up and land. We'd try to get be low enough where they couldn't see us, but we, they had spotters over there. And they, when they saw the dust come up, and they didn't have to see the helicopter, but they would see the dust, they know a helicopter. And you normally have about 15 seconds before the first round would come in. So you'd fly in there, plop down, kick the door open, and they would start with the bodies like cordwood. And they would not be in bags, they would just be bodies with various bullet wounds, shrapnel wounds, blown apart, arms blown up. And they would just throw them in. And when you'd get about 15 seconds, you'd say, go. That was quite uh, tragic occasionally. Uh, you know, sometimes your uh, helicopter uh, smelt like a hospital because there was uh, blood uh, and limbs missing and so forth of people who had been uh, blown up or hit. And of course, other times it smelled like a morgue because uh, you were carrying dead people out. And that was quite moving, quite moving, uh, something that was a new experience uh, for me. And uh, it's funny, since then, I have uh, I used to be a big uh, hunter, uh, hunting rabbits, squirrels, and so forth back in Tennessee. After I left Laos, I've never uh, killed anything. Security was a paramount concern for every crew member at all times. Aircraft were routinely hit by ground fire, even during seemingly benign missions to deliver food to villages. The pilots talked to each other throughout the day, and every crewman constantly scanned the terrain and crowds for the first sign of trouble. Most villages and troop positions were also issued a daily symbol, usually a colored letter that was to be placed on the ground as an aircraft approached. If the pilot did not actually see someone lay out the signal of the day, he generally assumed that the area had fallen under communist control and left immediately. The greatest assurance for security, though, often came from the men, women, and children of villages that surrounded most landing sites. Many pilots even carried candy with them to ensure that the villagers, and especially their children, would come to the sites as soon as they heard an approaching aircraft. They were the easiest way to determine if it was friendly or enemy. If the village was under unfriendly control, we fly over the airstrip, they would not let these people come to the airstrip. So that was the first clue that something's not right when nobody starts running to the airstrip whether the signal was put out or not. They may force them to put the signal out, but if they didn't run to the airstrip, something wasn't right. Greetings from villagers were often fueled by much more than casual curiosity. The fluid nature of combat in a war without boundaries frequently produced huge crowds of refugees. Pilots took on enormous risk to evacuate as many refugees as they could returning repeatedly to sites that were in imminent danger of being overrun. Pandemonium quickly ensued and worsened with the arrival of each successive aircraft. The fear of being left behind drove some mothers to throw infants on board aircraft that were already overloaded. Some refugees had to be pulled into helicopters that were already in flight after the crew chief discovered them clinging desperately to the skids below. They tried to have uh, either a Thai or uh, someone from the USAID to handle the refugee re relief to try to get it organized. So they would have them lined up and then they would cut it. And uh, a lot of times uh, it would just be panicky and uh, you had what you thought you could handle and you just left. They would normally have somebody that would control the people, but if the guy that was controlling was getting on the helicopter, everybody would fend for themselves. And you'd have to, you didn't know, once he got on, you didn't know who was supposed to go and who wasn't. So you just had, a, if the pilot said five people, you'd take five and the sixth, seventh, and eighth, they'd have to stay and you'd just either have to close the door or you'd have to, uh, I, put my foot in their chest several times to keep getting on board too. But the key to that was, if he wanted 10 at about six, you'd say, okay, go go ahead and take off. And the pilot was just supposed to take off. It didn't make any difference what he saw. He just had to go. The greatest threat to Air America crews often occurred during attempts to rescue downed airmen. 
hundreds of American and Laotian pilots were shot down over Laos while conducting reconnaissance and strike missions. The very fact that the pilots were brought down by ground fire generally meant that they wound up landing in extremely unfriendly terrain. American airmen throughout Southeast Asia depended on specially trained Air Force search and rescue units to rush to their aid if they were downed. But the rescue units usually staged from a base in Thailand that was more than 200 miles from the northern reaches of Laos. As a result, pilots working over Laos often depended upon the crews of Air America, who were in a unique position to provide assistance at the first sign of trouble. The Air America was working in the entire country of Laos, from one end to the other, all day, every day, seven days a week. So if something did happen, everything stopped in that area, and everybody went to help. Because the first hour is the golden hour to get somebody out, if they're in, particularly if they're in unfriendly territory. Early on, Air America pilots could even bring their own firepower to bear on recovery missions. During high-risk rescue attempts, the men could lay down suppressive fire from a handful of North American T-28 Trojans, small but potent trainer aircraft that had been heavily modified for use by Royal Laotian Air Force and Hmong combat pilots. Air America was eventually prohibited from using the 28s, but the crews became renowned for their repeated willingness to conduct some of the most daring recovery efforts ever, with absolutely no assistance at all. The men were not military personnel, but they felt a common bond with military airmen who shared in the unusual experience of working in Laos. That bond grew even stronger when the crew that had been downed was one of their own. On January 15, 1972, Jim Ryan almost lost his life on board a beach turbo Volpar while searching for George Ritter and the crew of Aircraft 293, the same plane that John McCraney had discovered missing several days earlier. The men were planning to dispense leaflets with details about the missing aircraft and a reward that was available for information leading to its discovery. But their search included one of the most heavily defended areas in all of Laos, a region in the western part of the country where Chinese troops were constructing a new road. decided we would fly sort of a horseshoe shaped pattern around this area of known gunfire. And I was cutting box tops off and we were dumping leaflets out this, this airplane hole and going around this turn. We got to one end of it and turned around and when we turned around they shot at us. And the first, second or third shot hit the airplane. And it was a direct hit. It wasn't a near miss. It came through, through the skin of the airplane, exploded between the skin and the floor of the airplane. Right under my where I was standing, or not standing, but pooped over in the back of the airplane. Ryan lost one of his legs, a hip, and sustained several other injuries in the explosion. But the pilot was able to recover the plane, and another crewman held on to Ryan, constantly applying pressure to his wounds until the men returned to Udorn nearly an hour later. Amazingly, after enduring more than six months of painful recovery, Ryan returned to Laos to fly for Air America again. Two years later, he received the honor of piloting the company's last flight out of Udorn. Many other pilots and crewmen were much less fortunate. Ultimately, nearly 250 men were killed or lost in action while working for Air America. Losses were taken extremely hard by everyone associated with the program. Word that an aircraft had gone missing spread like wildfire among the tight-knit community of families. Many pilots took it upon themselves to inform the wives of the men who were killed and help them in any way that they could. But at times, the grief of loved ones was complicated by CIA and company efforts to avoid unwanted publicity about the covert program. Almost instantly, it would, the word would get out, an aircraft is overdue, and then shortly after that would be a helicopter, and then, then you narrow it down further to 834, and 
If you were Huey, well, you didn't worry about it. But as the day would progress, he would get two hours or three hours or four hours overdue. Then, then people would, would start homing in on it. And eventually they would go out to, to the various families and tell them, hey, your, uh, your husband or father was killed and, and it wouldn't be more than two days and they'd be gone. You, and a lot of cases, you, you didn't even get a chance to say goodbye. They were just gone. It was difficult when uh, somebody got killed because uh, I, I thought they were a little callous with, with the widows and so forth. Uh, they were under pressure since they could no longer sponsor that individual to get them out of the country. And they would give them a, a few days to try to get packed and get things together. But uh, some of these widows didn't know what to do. They were distraught and had no idea what the next move was. So they, they kind of had to rush them. And that was, uh, I thought, a little hard on them. A number of controversial allegations have been made about Air America and CIA activities during the war in Laos. Among other things, the 1990 movie Air America and a book entitled The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia have suggested that both the company and the CIA helped local drug lords move opium to market in exchange for the support of local commanders and key groups like the Hmong. Some of the works have also suggested that individual pilots were profiteering in the drug trade or in the shipment and sale of arms. In my eight and a half years, I never saw any indication that anyone in the CIA had anything to do with the drug trade. I never saw any indication that any of my aircraft, and I have almost every multi-engine program in Southeast Asia, I never not on one occasion did I ever suspect that any drugs were being hauled in my airplane. Now, being a realist, I, I would say that obviously uh, <laughs> there were drugs hauled in my airplane from time to time by individual soldiers or individuals who were on my planes. But if you wanted to use that as a criteria, I'd say that Pan American, Eastern, and a whole lot of other airlines hauled <laughs> a lot more drugs than Air America ever did. If you ask me, did Air America aircraft ever haul drugs? I would say yes, they did. Did helicopters you flew in haul drugs? Yes, because we were in the Golden Triangle, the largest opium producing area in the world. Just flying around there, they were gonna haul drugs. Did we knowingly haul drugs? Absolutely not. It's nonsense. And uh, I think as anyone who had any involvement in the project in any form will tell you, uh, you, know, you can't police every person who gets on every airplane and what's in their pockets, but uh, that None of us ever saw any other uh, narcotics traffic uh, you know, beyond that. And we knew uh, who in Laos was involved in the illicit narcotics trade. And it was the elements of the Royal Lao government and the, and the, the Royal Lao Army and Air Force. Many of those who took part in Air America's operations eventually came to question the effectiveness of US strategies in Laos. They knew that they were providing badly needed assistance to tens of thousands of innocent people who had been ravaged by the ongoing conflict. They also knew that their support to military efforts in Laos diverted a tremendous amount of resources away from North Vietnamese efforts to defeat American and allied forces in South Vietnam. But the campaign took a horrific toll on the Hmong and others, and it became unclear whether their efforts could have ever had a lasting impact on the final outcome of the war. I have mixed feelings. I think most of us do. Uh, I was as committed as anyone to, in my concern, to the you know, so-called domino theory uh, at the time. Uh, the, the Hmong and other tribals would have been fighting the North Vietnamese whether we were there or not. They were fighting before we got there. They're, I understand, you know, on occasion, fighting them to, to today. Uh, what we tried to do was to make it possible. Uh, over the long haul, on the negative side, we contributed, uh, were involved in the, the death of an enormous number of the tribal men, uh, most of, uh, of a generation for all practical purposes. On the other side of the coin, with a small handful of Americans, 
we tied down three regular North Vietnamese divisions that uh, were held in Laos when they could have been in Vietnam fighting uh, American troops. Regardless of the ultimate outcome politically, the campaign in Laos marked a high point in the careers and lives of those associated with Air America's operations in Southeast Asia. Many of the crews initially came to the program for the adventure, the flying, and the money. But most wound up risking everything in a secret paramilitary war under some of the most grueling operating conditions in history for a cause that they truly believed in. It was a very, very special experience, a very special time, I think, for all of us who were involved. Uh, most of us, uh, regardless of what level we were working at, had more responsibility than we ever had again in terms of life and death and you know, really big decisions. Uh, we were involved, uh, all of us, the CIA and the Air America people, in something not everybody could do, not every conditions not everybody could operate in. We knew it, we're proud of it, and we believed in what we were doing. And uh, you're working under difficult conditions with really great people. That's something special. And uh, you know, as time goes on, I think most of us begin to appreciate just how special it was. I've never experienced anything before or after that even holds a candle to the Air America experience. And, and all, of all the friends that I have, I've been active in the uh, Air America Association and past president. I talk with people who've done some amazing things since, and they all still say that the highlight of their life are the years they were with Air America. <laughs>